All right, well, good morning. Welcome to Pocono Evangelical Free Church. So glad that you can join us today and we can worship the Lord together. I do have a few announcements. I want to make a mention first that our Sunday morning as well as our Wednesday evening times are now done. So uh, uh, if you missed them, well, hopefully there's always the fall. We can we can start things up again. So keep that in mind. But but just so everyone knows that we're no longer running those at this time. We are still running our young adults group focus here at the church at 630, as well as youth group at six o'clock on Tuesday here at the church. We got two more weeks of youth group. Uh, so uh, so if you know of any youth that want to come, Invite them. We'd love to have them. Okay. Uh, also want to make mention uh, that uh, uh, our online service is going to be at 630 uh, today, Lord willing. Uh, that's what we're going to be attempting to do. We are slowly getting into summer here. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. And with that in mind comes some of our summer things that we try to do. Uh, one of the things that we uh, would love to do every, every summer is try to do some barbecues or picnics and things like that. Uh, so if that's something that you are interested in hosting, uh, please see me after. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what that, all that entails and, uh, and what that kind of looks like. But uh, we're looking forward to just getting the time to fellowship with one another after church on a Sunday. Uh, and, uh, and we'll hopefully do a few of them as is the goal anyway. Um, so if you have any, if you're wanting to know any, anything more on that, see me afterwards. I want to also make mention next week we're having our congregational meeting here at the church. So after uh, service on Sunday, uh, just make sure that you stay uh, around for that and uh, can be a part of the of the meeting, especially if you're a member. If you're not a member but you just want to be there and figure out what's going on or what we're doing, you're welcome to be there. You can't vote, but you can certainly be a part of uh, the meeting. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member. Come see me. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about membership. Uh, another cool thing that's happening this summer is we're getting ready for our VBS. Uh, we're going to be kicking off a VBS. We haven't done a VBS since 2019, uh, and that, that was only a three-day VBS, right? So uh, it's been a really long time since we've gotten to do this, but we're getting a chance to do it again, and so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, so keep that in mind. August 7th through 11th is going to be from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. We need volunteers. We need uh, kids. We need all of that. We're, we're going to need help. So if you're interested in being a part of that and helping, uh, uh, come see me, and I can give you a little bit more information on that. Okay, anything else, Dad? Good. All right. Well, with that in mind, let's come to the Lord and worship. I want to encourage you uh, to stand if you'd like to stand. If you'd like to sit, that's fine, too. If you can't see, move so you can see. But no matter what we do, may our hearts be directed toward our great and awesome God. Uh, remember that it's not enough to just sing the words. We need to sing with our hearts, too, with all our souls. So if you would, worship with us.
to you. I will dance before you. I will shout it. I will shout it to you. Oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to like to read as we get ready to sing How Great Thou Art from Psalm chapter 8. Verse 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. Skipping down in verse 3, it says this, when I consider, I love that, when I consider, when I think about, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you would take thought of him and the son of man that you would care for him? We get kind of caught up sometimes in our own little world. And really, it's really about God and his glory and His uh, who he is. And when you look out at the beauty of, the, of nature, uh, of the universe, and the things that we look at, that all demonstrates the glory of God. So as we sing this song, let's sing of the greatness of our God. Oh, Lord, my God, when I am awesome wonder,
I uh, do want to make mention there is a basket in the back for tithes and offerings. Let's uh, take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today and we are just amazed at your greatness. For you indeed are a great and awesome, a majestic God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take time to consider the works of your fingers, the works of your hands. And Lord, it, it may impress upon us when we consider how great you are, how small we are too. And yet you love us. Lord, we thank you for that wonderful truth. We thank you that even though we are just but a breath, a vapor, that you were willing to send your son to die on the cross for us so that we could be with you for eternity. Lord, we thank you for these things. Lord, we thank you for the grace that we have through Jesus Christ. And we look forward to the day when one day we will see you face to face. Lord, help us to live our whole lives for you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Your grace that leads the sinner home from death to life forever. Sing the song of righteousness by blood and not by merit. By grace I am redeemed. By grace I am restored. Lost. 
and on that day we will see you shine brighter than the sun on that day we will know you Dismissed to kids' kingdom. We missed that hallelujah, Azariah, as he goes up to it. There he goes again. They're back from Trinidad. Welcome back, Pastor Jay and Azariah. Um, and Anna, welcome back. Not back, but I'm sure you're welcoming them back. So great, great to have you all here. Um, want to continue a very important series called the Beatitudes, and I, I really don't like the term Beatitude necessarily, it comes from the Latin Vulgate, but uh, really what we're talking about is blessedness. And what does it mean to be blessed? And, and Jesus kind of takes a complete twist on blessedness. Today we're going to be looking at righteousness, and we will be looking at hungering and thirsting for righteousness specifically. Uh, but the first three messages that we looked at, we looked at what were, uh, were often called paradoxes. Those things that are true that seem to be contradictory. Uh, it seems strange that somebody who's poor in spirit would be blessed, right? It seems strange as somebody who's mourning that they would be blessed. It seems strange that somebody who's meek would be blessed, but we saw that. Now we shift into more of the character, although meekness is definitely a character issue. We shift into more of the character, and we go into the character of righteousness, and then we go into the character of mercifulness, purity, and then peace, being a peacemaker or peace. And so we'll shift into the next four messages into what I would consider kind of like a new section of uh, the Beatitudes. And then we'll finish up looking at persecution uh, in verse 9 through 12. But today, our text comes from verse 6, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. I'm just going to read the one verse today, and uh, we'll get started right away. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Father, thank you for this great reminder of the importance of righteousness. We thank you that Jesus reiterates the truths of righteousness throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And we're very mindful, Lord, today that our righteousness is not in and of ourselves, but our righteousness is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And may we rejoice in our righteousness in him. And may we live in that righteousness. And may we be blessed in that righteousness. And may the pattern of our, of our life reflect the righteousness of Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes there are things that happen in your life that you don't like. But you have to do them anyway. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> um, such was my week this week. I had to get in my syllabus. My syllabus for the grad class I'm teaching, it's a grief and trauma class, in the fall, in September and October, I'll be teaching on Saturdays. Uh, but the class that I'm teaching requires a syllabus, and it requires the professor to submit the syllabus. And it reminded me of the 25 years I've been teaching, how I really dislike doing syllabi. <laughs> and this one happens to be 14 pages. And after teaching it last year, I had to revise some of the syllabus. And revising the syllabus can be complicated because they're going through a process of accreditation for licensure and counseling. And so not only do you have to record the objectives on the side, but you have to record the what's called KCREP criteria also. And I'm like, oh, Lord, this is not fun. <laughs> it really wasn't too bad. But, you know, it just reminded me of there's certain things in our lives that may be difficult. And righteousness is not easy, folks, particularly when we live in an unrighteous world. Righteousness is not easy. 
but it's an essential part of the Christian life. And we need to be devoted to righteousness. We need to be pursuing righteousness. And finally, and we'll look at this in our second point, we need to be passionate about righteousness in our lives. And so we come to, again, that picture of blessedness. And Jesus said, blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Once again, I'm going to give you a little bit more color to the whole idea of blessed. We've been looking at different aspects of the blessedness that Jesus is talking about. And today, I want to continue with our main uh, definition of bless. Bless means, according to word study, to have God extend his benefits to you. That's what being blessed is. And I think that's a very accurate description of what Jesus is saying here. God extends his benefits to those who are blessed. But I thought in light of the context of the hunger and thirst for righteousness, Clark's commentary on this would be very significant. And he makes this very simple point. He says, we're not influenced by fate or chance. The world without Christ is often influenced by the concept of, well, maybe or maybe not. Right? And he says, we're not influenced by fate or chance. And then he goes on, and I know it's old English, but Clark wrote back way back when. But he then goes on to say, but we're governed by an all-wise providence. And I'm going to change that definition up, and I'm going to make it a little more adaptable to us. But I love the definition, and I think it's adaptable to what we're looking at today. We don't live for chance. We live and are governed by the grace of God in our lives. Isn't that beautiful? That I can depend, that's what providence involves, the providence of God. I can depend upon God and his grace and look to that day to day. And in the context of righteousness, this word is used twice within the Beatitudes or the Blesseds. It's used also in verse 10. And in verse 10, we'll see the context of righteousness again. So I'll get to that in a moment. But I thought it was interesting in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, and I may come back to this text in a different way, but I just wanted to show you how even when you suffer, even when you go through difficulty, even when things are confusing, even when things are problematic in your life, Peter says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, if you're doing it for that which is right, you are blessed. The same word that's used 50 times, nine times in our text. Now that should cause us to stop and consider what kind of pathway we're on. Are we on the pathway of blessedness? As I was thinking about that and meditating upon that, my mind went to Psalm 23 and verse 3. He restores my soul, David says. He restores my soul. Do you know what happens when God restores? Talks about a blessing, right? Isn't that a great blessing? God restores your soul. Then he goes on to say, and he leads me in the what? The paths of righteousness. But if we miss the last part, we miss the significance of what David has discovered about the paths of righteousness and the blessing of walking in the paths of righteousness. He says, for your name's sake, for your glory, for your praise, to give thanks to you. You see the importance of what David understood? Yes, God restores our soul. Yes, God guides and leads us in the paths of righteousness, but he does so for the purpose of his glory, for his name's sake. And we cannot be blessed 
when we're selfish and doing it for our sake. And righteousness guides us back to doing it for the glory of God. And so that brings this question, what are the blessed paths? <laughs> and what is blessed about those paths of righteousness? First of all, the paths of righteousness, they truly guide us, don't they? As Psalm 23 says in verse, um, in, in, in verse the second part, he leads me, he guides me in the paths of righteousness. Secondly, um, as we saw in 1 Peter, he protects us with his blessing. Even when we suffer. You see, the paths of righteousness are where God guides. The paths of righteousness are where God guards and protects. Think about it for a moment. If you choose unrighteousness in the decision you make today, what happens? Don't you face the consequences for your choice in choosing the path of unrighteousness? But when God guides you in the path of righteousness and you choose that, doesn't God guard and protect you? Amen. And finally, folks, it's a guarantee. David doesn't say he might restore your soul. He might refresh your soul. He might bring that river of life to your soul. It says what? He restores my soul. David understood that. God is a great God. God is a God of righteousness. And what his righteousness, as we'll look at in a moment, is applied to us. We have a guarantee. We have a guarantee. And the path of righteousness should lead us to the passion for righteousness, which is the second point. The blessed path of righteousness should always move us to having a passion, a hunger, and a thirst. And Guzik defines that as passion. We need to have this passion for that which is righteousness. Now let's take a look at these two words, hunger and thirst. Because Jesus now is going to a crowd that was very hungry for things that may not have been godly. In fact, he addresses that in John chapter 6, and we'll get to that in our third point. And we'll also look at John chapter 6 here in our first point. But Jesus is addressing a crowd that was concerned about being temporally filled and not filled with that which would last and be eternal. And so it's very important for us to ask the question of us, of us individually today, what am I hungering or what am I pa passionate about? This word passion really represents this word hunger, as Guzik points out. Because a number of people, including Thayer, talks about having this strong desire. And Thayer combines the idea of strong desire with need. I'm needy and I have a strong desire. After Rhonda passed away, my first wife, I was no longer hungry physically. I had to force myself to eat every evening. Yes, I did not eat <laughs> until evening. Sometimes I didn't eat or drink until evening. But in the evening, I knew I needed food. I just wasn't hungry. It's interesting. Kathy did the same thing. By the way, we eat breakfast now again. We have to for her health's sake. <laughs> I don't know if it helps my tummy's sake, but it helps our health's sake. And so we, we eat our fiber in the morning. Yeah, we have a good fiber breakfast. But I, I wasn't hungry. Why? I lost my spouse, right? And my hunger was gone. And if, if I just listened to my physical body, by the way, I ate a lot in the evening because I knew I needed to eat calories. And for those of you who remember, who knew me back then, I lost a lot of weight. I lost 40, 50 pounds. So I lost a lot of weight. And I didn't look good. It wasn't like when you lose weight that way, it doesn't look good. You just look like you're pale and, you know. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is hunger is important, isn't it? If our body doesn't have a desire for food, that could be a big problem, couldn't it? 
And likewise here, hunger is important because we need to hunger for spiritual things. We need to hunger for Christ. We need to have this passion for the things of Christ. In John chapter 6, this whole chapter is really important. And you know, you, you, know, you don't have too many books in the Bible that has chapter 6 and verse 66. Did you get it? <laughs> chapter 6 and verse 66. I don't know if the people who added, the numbers were added after. So, But I don't know if the people who, who uh, added the numbers did this intentionally or not. But John 6.66, it says, And the di disciples withdrew. The disciples withdrew from Jesus. Not the twelve, but the disciples. So after this chapter, when Jesus addresses hunger... The vast majority of his followers, his disciples, left. Isn't that fascinating? <clears throat> and listen to what Jesus says in John 6 and verse 35. I have 36 there. That should be 35 too. It's the same verse. I am the bread of what? Life. He just addresses, we'll look in our last one. He just addressed, you guys are trying to make me king. They literally wanted him to be king because you were your stomachs were filled. But I am the bread of what? Of life. There's something greater. There's something more significant. There's something more powerful that I want to give you. And this is the bread of life. And notice what he says. I am the bread of life. He who what? Comes. He who comes to me shall never hunger. Now, the word hunger is used 23 times in the New Testament, and the word thirst is used 16 times. And of the times that they are used, nine of those times they're used together. Nine of the times. That's a lot. So usually hunger and thirst are combined together in the same thought, meaning Basically the same thing. In fact, Barnes defines this as Thayer defined hunger as strong desire. Barnes defines this thirst as strong desire. But I'd like to give you Thayer's definition of this word. Again, just use 16 times, 9 of the times, with the word, word hunger. And Thayer defines this type of hunger as eager longing. You get that? Eager longing. Eager longing for what? The refreshment. And I love that. The refreshment of the soul. Now, I think he got that from Psalm 42. I don't know if he was reading Psalm 42 that morning in his quiet time as he is putting this definition of thirst together. But if you remember, Psalm 42 is, As the deer, what? Panteth for the water, so my soul panteth for you. And Thayer takes the concept of the soul thirsting for God. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never thirst. And then that same verse, I know I have it wrong in my notes there. But in that same verse, 35, he says, And he who believes in me shall never, what? Thirst. Now we'll talk about that satisfaction that God brings to our lives when Jesus is there. And more importantly, as we'll see it in a moment, when righteousness is there. Because our righteousness is in Jesus, so Jesus must be there for righteousness to be there. Let me say that again. Jesus must be here for righteousness to be here. Now, we got passion here, right? The passion. Passion for what? For righteousness. This word is an important word. The word that we have in our text is used 92 times in the New Testament. And the word that's most often translated righteous, because I combined the two. So this word righteousness is same in verse 10. And chapter 3 in verse 10 of Romans, by the way, Romans uses this word righteous over and over again. 36 on this word and then more on the other word. But this word, there is none what? Righteous, no, not one. That word 
If you look in the Greek dictionary, by Strong's definition, is one and two. Righteousness and righteous. All right, so they're right together. That word's used 81 times, and they mean the same thing. Quick check, check on my math, Kathy, 173 times. <laughs> 173 times this word righteousness is used in the New Testament. It is a fundamental, important concept that we need to comprehend. Jesus repeats the concept of righteousness in verse 10 in the Beatitudes. It's only one of two Beatitudes that the repeated thought is there. He says, blessed are those that are persecuted for what? Righteousness sake, verse 10. He comes back to righteousness in chapter 6. Actually uses it throughout the Sermon of the Mount. But in chapter 6, as he's concluding the thought of, don't treasure the things here on earth. And then he goes right from there into, don't worry, don't be anxious about what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what clothes you'll have. And then he concludes with verse 36 in chapter 6. But seek first his kingdom... And what? His righteousness. His righteousness. Same word. Vitally important word. Word study defines this word as judicial. Judicial approval. And then he goes on in his definition of this word to define this word not only as judicial approval, but a verdict of approval. That's pretty important, isn't it? Vine defines this word as the character, the character or quality. So now we're getting into characterology in the idea of character. What is your character? He defines it as the character or quality of being right. And Thayer says this. He says, Righteousness is the accepted position of God. God accepts righteousness. And I'm going to change Thayer's definition. God only accepts righteousness, folks. God never accepts unrighteousness. That's why Jesus died on the cross for your unrighteousness. Look at how these two words are used. Romans 10, or Romans 3, verse 10. There is none righteous. How many? None. No, not what? One. Say, so, well, what about Jesus? That's the exact reason why Jesus could not be born of man, but was born of a virgin. Because he was righteous. It's the very reason. All unrighteousness is applied to everyone. No, not one, right, is considered righteous in God's eyes. That's why we have 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He who knew no sin, he who was what? Purely righteous. He who knew no sin became sin for what? For us. And then notice the word righteousness here. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that he or that we, I'm sorry, might become the righteousness of God. In him, not in ourselves, but in Christ. If we don't have Christ, folks, we have nothing. We are unrighteous. We are stuck in our sins. We are going to spend eternity separated from God. And I know people don't like to say it, but that is forever in the lake of fire. And by the way, if you get hell and the lake of fire confused, hell is thrown into the lake of fire. Just to clarify that. But the reality is, is the lake of fire is where you will be punished for all eternity by being separated from God. I say to all of us here and I say to all who listen on this, make sure you have the righteousness of Christ because your righteousness will not cut it, folks. Amen. So now what? That same word is used again. We're to put off the old man, the sinner, 
Jay, I think before you went to Trinidad, we were having a discussion again. Are we sinners? Are we not? Are we saved by grace? Yes, we are. But our old creature, our old man, is still a sinner. That's what Paul was talking about when he says, wretched man that I what? That I am. Not that I was. He wasn't talking about his new creation in Christ. He was talking about his old man. And it makes perfect sense as you read 1 John, when John in chapter 1 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But then he goes on to say, if we sin, we have no part of him. Why? He's talking about the old man and the new man. And likewise here, this concept of righteousness is directly connected to the fact that you are a new creature in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we're to put aside, we're to put away the old man. And look what Ephesians says in chapter 4 and verse 24. Put on the what? The new man. Put on the new man, which was created according to God in what? In true righteousness. Now that brings us to several vital, important conclusions. We need the righteousness of Jesus, don't we? And so let's take a look at how do we grow? How do we grow in this hunger, this thirst for righteousness? And I would start by just saying we need to come to Jesus. Isn't that what he said? I am the bread of life. He who what? Comes to me. Shall never hunger. How are we coming to Jesus today? I know that we often connect that concept to our salvation. But today, this very day, we need to be concerned about how are we coming to Jesus? Let's have a coming to Jesus party, right? <laughs> Amen. Let's make sure that when we have our quiet time, our quiet time isn't just checking off the box to say, I read the word of God today and I spent a little time in prayer. Even prayed for the pastor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now let's make sure that our time in the word is a coming to Jesus. My sheep hear my voice, right? Secondly, not only do we need to be coming to Jesus, but he who believes in me shall what? Never thirst. Again, John 635, the second part. I got the reference right there. See? <laughs> Boy, this is such an important part of our everyday life. Believing Jesus. Believing Jesus when something goes wrong. <clears throat> believing Jesus when you gotta put a syllabus together that you don't want to. The due date's coming up. <laughs> and I put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off. <laughs> And then you get the due date. <laughs> and then you get reminders of the due date. <laughs> Kathy, do you send them out to the faculty? Yes, she does. <laughs> I have somebody who sends me out reminders. But believing Jesus in everything, amen? Even when it's something I know I need to do but don't want to do. And that means, finally, and thirdly, living. Living in Christ. As first... Corinthians chapter 5, and earlier in verse 17 says, we are new creation. I should have put verse 17 in there. You can mark it in your notes. And then it goes into the context of the fact that we've been created in righteousness in him. And that we should put off that old man now and live in the context of Christ in him, in righteousness. So how are we doing Not yesterday, not when, man, there was just an exciting time in your life in the Lord, but how are we doing in the day-to-day -day grind? Isn't that a different question? Because the day-to-day -day grind can really take us out of the concept and the perspective that we need to have, and that is, Jesus, help me to come to you now. Jesus, help me to believe in you. Jesus, help me to live in you. And that takes us right to the last point. Jesus says, blessed are those 
through hunger and thirst for righteousness. For the same word that we've had, we've looked at it multiple times, it's there nine times, the word horti. For causation, there's a connection here. For they shall be filled. For they shall be filled. Now I want to go back to, but seek first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. What does it say? Seek, right? What does it then conclude in chapter 7 and verse 7? Ask and it will be what? Given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be open. You see, righteousness is flowing all the way through Jesus' thought in the Sermon of the Mount. And he says, you're blessed. You're blessed if you're passionate, hungry, and thirsty for righteousness. Because that's what you're seeking. That's what you're looking for. And you'll find it. But what if I'm hungry for the wrong thing? What if I'm hungry for unrighteousness? Don't you think that I will get unrighteousness for being hungry for the thing that I'm seeking? You see my point? And so it's essential. And Jesus brings this as essential characterological issue in the Christian life. It's essential for me to embrace this concept of righteousness. Because Jesus says, you'll be filled. Now, this word's only used 15 times, and it's usually used of literally being having your stomach full. That's usually how it's used. Here it's used in a spiritual context. It's not used in a figure, it's used in a figurative way, not a literal way. It's used about being filled spiritually. And I would put the word fulfilled along with the word satisfied. Both Thayer and Vincent put the word satisfy. But I like how Winston defines, uh, Vincent defines in his Greek commentary this particular word. He says, this is complete satisfaction spiritually of our hunger and thirst. Let me repeat that definition. This is complete satisfaction of our spirit of the spiritual in our hunger and thirst. I think that's beautiful. Jesus wants to fill you spiritually. Yes, he wants to take care of your meals and make sure you have plenty to eat. Therefore, we have the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our what? Daily bread. Daily bread. But it doesn't stop there, does it? But it talks about all the spiritual needs that we also need. Deliverance from the enemy, right? Forgiveness as we forgive others. Even praying that his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Those are all spiritual things and those are the things that Jesus wants to fill us with today. And so this word is essentially important. And Jesus knows in John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, that the people had wrong motives. They were seeking him out. They wanted to make him even king. He had just fed them from some loaves, a few loaves and fishes, and it had multiplied. So 5,000 men plus children and women were fed. Some calculated probably over 10,000. That's a pretty amazing feat, isn't it? Amazing feat. And Jesus addresses them. And he says this. Look at John chapter 6 and verse 26. You seek me. Mm. Isn't that key? You see, I would put that idea of seeking all the way through. Seek first his kingdom and what? His righteousness. Seek and you will find. Chapter 7 and verse 7. Now he says, hey, listen. You seek me not because you saw the signs. Now what were the signs? It wasn't just the miracles Jesus is talking about here. What's vitally important is when Jesus is talking about the signs, he's talking about the signs of who he is. 
It's coming back to coming and believing and living in Jesus. He says, you weren't seeking the signs of finding the true Messiah. Why did you seek me? You sought me not because you saw the sign, but because you ate of the loaves and were what? Were filled. One of the 15 times that this word is particularly used in the New Testament. But Jesus doesn't stop there. It's a little bit like treating Jesus like the genie in the bottle. Jesus, I need this. Can you give it to me? Jesus, I need this. Can you give that to me? I want this. It goes from I need to what I want. And I want this. And can you give me that? And you see what I'm saying? That's treating Jesus not Lord of Lord and King of Kings. That's treating Jesus like he's your servant and to bid him to do whatever you want. And yes, I'm guilty too. But that's convicting, isn't it? So he goes on to convict them and to challenge them. And he says this, do not labor for the food that what? Perishes. Don't labor for that. But for the food which endures to what? Everlasting life. That is the sign that Jesus was giving them, that he was life. I am the way, the truth, and the what? The life. What we pursue, what we seek, Jesus can't give it to us unless it's his sign. But the everlasting thing, he says, and which the Son of Man, what? Will give to you. It will happen. I want to close with an amazing psalm. I just thought, I, you know, I was just blessed by it. Psalm 63. Yes, it talks about thirsting, so that was pretty good because our text talks about thirsting. It starts with verse 1, and, and, and David, it's David here, says, My soul thirsts for you. Notice it's his soul. His inward being, that thirst for God. He then goes on in verse 2 to say, hey, I've looked for you. Notice that. I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see two things. To see your power and your glory. And then he goes on in verse 3 to say, hey, listen, I will bless you, Lord. Or I guess that's verse 4. Verse 3, your loving kindness is better than life and I will bless you. But look at verse 5 of Psalm 63. David says this, My soul shall be what? Satisfied. Satisfied. Jesus is saying, listen, if you're seeking me and my righteousness, you will be satisfied. It may be difficult. But it is the path of righteousness. It is the passion for righteousness that takes us to what truly satisfies. We all know that we have gone the path of unrighteousness and it never satisfies. Am I right? It just doesn't satisfy. So let's make sure we're on the path of righteousness. I call this in my last point a pattern. If you notice here, the pattern of righteousness and I took the pattern from the idea of Psalm 63. The pattern of thirsting, passion for God. The pattern of looking, seeking for God. The pattern of enjoying his loving kindness and blessing him. And the pattern of being satisfied. We need this daily in our life. We need the pattern of righteousness. Not just in the past when we were saved. But we need it every day. And so I propose to you, the pattern of righteousness starts with what? Seeking the Lord. My soul thirsts for you. It is essential to me to be one of those, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It is essential for us to be seekers, to seek Jesus. And so the first point is to be seeking the Lord. Secondly, to be seeing him. That I may behold your glory and your power in the sanctuary. Do you know what the New Testament sanctuary is? 
not this. You might think of it as this. And this is important. This is the gathering. And Jesus says, where two or three are gathered, there am I in your midst. There's no doubt that he says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. There's, these are all true. So this place is very important for us, right? But it's not this place that is now the sanctuary. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 makes that very clear. The sanctuary of the Holy Spirit now is no longer the temple, but it is you. In chapter 6 and verse 19, Paul says, What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the sanctuary? May we behold today in the sanctuary of our bodies the righteousness, holiness, and glory of God. So we need to seek it. We need to be seeing that. And then we need to be satisfied with what truly satisfies. Yeah, we got some good desserts back there, <laughs> stuff like that. And every week we got some good stuff, don't we? <laughs> but we need to seek that which is eternal and be satisfied with that. So in conclusion, as we close today, I have, Lord, help me, or help me, Lord. Amen? Amen. Help me, Lord. Three thoughts on help me, Lord, as we close in prayer. Help me, Lord, to be blessed by what? His paths of righteousness. <clears throat> help me, Lord, to have the passion, to be passionate about righteousness. And then help me, Lord, to allow the patterns of seeking and seeing you in my life to truly satisfy my soul. Let's pray. Father, we are just so gracious for your word, for your power, for your goodness to us. Lord, what, a, what an amazing truth that Jesus gives to us. May we have those paths of righteousness and the passion for righteousness and the pattern daily of righteousness in our lives, that we might truly be satisfied with Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen. And I look into your home. Worship him. So worship the Lord. Have a great day.